Good afternoon, or good morning, or possibly good evening, depending where you are. Um, I'm Richard Schwartz. I'm the Head of Research at Global Custodian, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this online discussion webinar. Um, the subject is private capital funds, the race to meet rising data demands, and it arises from some research that we did together with Intertrust Group on how private capital fund CFOs saw their role changing or the pressures they were going to come under in the years ahead. And the questions that we're going to discuss are largely drawn from that um, study, and it, it is available for download, or it will be, uh, in the handout section of the platform, which you'll see on the right-hand side. Uh, also, before we start, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function, um, and they'll be routed to me and onto the panel. If by any chance you ask a question and we don't get to, to answer it, we'll make sure that someone follows up after the event. Uh, I'm now going to ask uh, each of the panelists. So in, rather than me reading off uh, their expertise, I'm going to ask Chitra, Patrick, Cyril, and Makbul in that order, just to introduce themselves briefly and to explain their engagement with the topic, because you may find that you want to ask a question to a specific panelist. So if we could start with Chitra. Hey, thank you, Richard. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Nice to have you on this uh, discussion. Uh, I, I, I'm Chitra Baskar, Chief Operating Officer of uh, Intertrust Group. Uh, over the last 20 years, I have built a fund administration practice uh, focused on the alternative in investments world, both the liquid assets and the liquid alls and the private equity side. Uh, I've seen the industry dramatically change over the time, and uh, I, I'm clearly interested and, and keen, and keen to hear all your views about uh, what what is it the data needs, the increasing demand of how we need to service our clients, and the demands that keeps coming from our funds, which in turn are pushed by the LPs. That is that is my interest, and that is my topic of uh, uh, concern, as I would say, being a service provider. So. Thanks, and uh, look forward to the interactions. Thanks. And Patrick? Thanks, Richard. My name is uh, Patrick Burness. Nice to be here. Uh, I'm heading fund operations at EQT since 2013. Now, some relevant areas of, of my responsibilities for, for, for this discussion is that I'm responsible for fund management, also under the European Directive, AFMD. I also had the responsibility for the oversight of our third parties uh, service provider, uh, mainly in, in fund admin, but some other areas as well. We are responsible for the data collection for the portfolio companies, for valuations, investor reporting, and, and other things. Uh, for those who you who are not familiar with EQT, EQT is a, a global investment organization founded in Stockholm, Sweden, 1994 by the <clears throat> year end of 2020, we had around 52.5 billion uh, euros asset under management. We are listed at the NASDAQ Stockholm Stock Exchange. Uh, we only do active, what we call active ownership strategies, so no debt strategies. And we have two main business segments in private capital and, and real assets. Our funds are mostly domiciled in, in Luxembourg, and we we work with mainly one third-party fund service uh, admin provider. Thank you, Richard. Thanks. Cyril. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm in Zurich, so it's good afternoon from my side. Um, Cyril Bemaya, I have 20 years of experience as a practitioner. I've been working all along the, the value chain of uh, private equity, so at the fund investor level, either for uh, financial institutions or fund of funds, I've also worked for funds. That's how I started my career 20 years ago in a venture fund. I managed two uh, on my spare time at the moment. And I also work for underlying companies as a consultant. 
And so my hat today is, is double. I'm, um, I'm uh, from academia. I'm an affiliate professor with a French business school. And uh, I'm also a big user of data because uh, my day-to-day -day job actually is to do uh, empirical research and uh, serving clients who can be fund managers or fund investors by analyzing data and, and producing hopefully uh, uh, fruitful uh, information for them. Thanks. And Makbul. Thank you, Richard. Uh, my name is Makbul Mohammed. I'm the CFO, CEO at Clarion Partners Europe. Uh, I've been the CFO uh, here since 2019. Before that, I've worked since 20, 2001 um, in the investment management space. Uh, Clarion Partners uh, is a real estate fund manager managing about 56 billion of AUM. Uh, they took a majority stake in the European business of which I'm part in 2019. Um, and like Jitra, I've been in this space since 2001. A lot has changed, but also a lot hasn't changed as well. So a lot of stuff in real estate in particular has stayed the same as it was 20 years ago. Uh, so I'm also very keen to sort of uh, hear people's um, perspectives on, on, on some of the topics we're discussing. Uh, I've also worked with all the service providers uh, in the market, well, not all of them, but most of them. So, uh, And we today at, at Clarion, we work with multiple service providers. Thanks a lot. Okay, let's go straight into it now. Um, what we're going to do is set the scene a bit for what traditionally has happened, because um, as Makbul just said, there's a lot that hasn't changed, as well as a lot that that has or is about to. And then we'll look forward uh, and dig into some of the results of, of our research and what the implications are. So to start with, um, in my mind, I mean, perhaps I'm wrong, but I've never thought of CFO as a particularly customer-facing role. Um, traditionally, what, how have LPs made their wishes known or have they had specific wishes that they wanted the CFO to hear about? What are the sort of channels, normal channels of communication between, uh, you know, private fund and uh, and the investors in the in the fund, and perhaps we can start with Cyril on that because you've been all along the value chain. So. Yes, definitely. Um, my experience has been that uh, the key point, the key touch point, is uh, during the, the due diligence. So when you're willing to commit to a, a new fund, uh, normally there is a stage where you would like to see the, the reporting from the fund manager analyzing the track record, but also the flow of the, the the data which is communicated to the current investors and if there is any specific request then you would start here to point it out and then as you're progressing towards let's say the commitment then it would materialize um, sometimes it's it's more of a gentleman's agreement because unfortunately it's still very much uh, a man's world um, but also sometimes it it, it it lands into a side letter and it, it's much more formal i've never never really seen any limited partnership agreement or fund regulation which would be amended at heart to actually fulfill, uh, uh, um, let's say, a communication uh, target or a data exchange target. But side letters can be a, a tool which has been used in the past. Um, Makpul, does that sound like a fairly standard uh, pattern from your experience? Uh I've been at Clarion since 2020. I've worked in another of, a number of other CFO finance type roles. First of all, I think that role has a different meaning in different companies, right? Um, uh, with different fund managers. And that can be driven by uh, the type of the fund manager. For example, it could be an investment manager that's part of a larger financial institution, in which case the role has a lot of corporate reporting. The assets you're invested in, uh, the size of the fund manager, right? If you have a lot of people in the finance and operations department, some functions might be done by other people. So I can only speak of what I'm doing today, but I think that role can have different meanings in different firms. Uh, it could be purely finance and accounting focused. It could be more involved with debt financing, investor relations, uh, strategic initiatives, or combination of any of these. In my current role, which, you know, we're, we're a smaller European platform, which is part of a bigger uh, global platform, but the European business operates independently and raises its own funds. 
I am more involved than I was, for example, uh, in previous roles with investors in anything that's to do with uh, non-investments, right? So my uh, CEO and, and our head of investor relations will talk to LPs on anything that's to do with investment strategy and return profiles, but then anything beyond that comes to me, the structuring the deals, back office due diligence, reporting, all of that. And ultimately, all the DDQs initially end up on, on my desk. I might seek input from colleagues, but ultimately, you know, in, in smaller sort of fund managers, it's often the CFO slash COO that has to deal with that. Uh, in some larger outfits, other departments might be involved. But I think also with some of the requirements that are compliance related, ESG, all that sort of stuff, which we'll discuss, more and more is being pushed um, to the CFO just because people don't like dealing with it and they just push it to the CFOs. Right. So traditionally, I mean, we'll be looking a fair amount of data and the data that uh, LPs expect to receive and how it's delivered. But Chitra, from your experience, has there been much change, say, over the past decade, before we look forward, into the kinds of data that uh, LPs expect to receive? Uh I think I will very strongly and affirmatively say yes. Uh, I think there is there is a definitive and clear push towards more transparency, more information that people want to know. I mean, the whole journey of going into separately managed accounts also comes from the need for more oversight or control or data needs that uh, allocators and uh, investors do have. Uh, I, I think the liquid alt world and we call the hedge funds has significantly changed over the years and, and, and the private capital world is clearly coming on the back of it in terms of expectations. The investors are kind of the same for changing their allocations and their uh, money pool from one place to another, from highly liquid to liquid alts now to private capital. So these demands are changed significantly. And uh, I, I think with the, it's a one-way street. It's going to keep moving in that direction, uh, as we go along, it's 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 on companies, it's on investments, it's on the robustness of the operations, it's on IT infrastructure and cyber. So there are demands everywhere from investors to make sure uh, they're in a comforting, comforted place when it comes to uh, how the fund is run and how its uh, various aspects of the fund is uh, managed. Patrick, are you one of those people responsible for the increase in expectations of? Uh... Uh, <laughs> I, I I don't I don't know about that, but 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 I think uh, I think uh, there have been some good points raised here. Uh, I mean the 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 number of side letters and and the bespoke requests uh, coming with them on on the reporting side has definitely increased the last couple of years. That's that's definitely a strong trend we can see from our. Our, our LPs acting as a GP. So clearly we're going in, in that direction. Right. Um, if, before we get into data in general and, and data delivery, if you were to rank the things that bother a, a CFO at a private capital fund, the things that stop them sleeping, well, if that, if nothing, the things that stop them getting to sleep immediately, would data and data demands and expectations be high on the list? Would it be considered manageable? So where does it fit in terms of the challenges that a CFO faces? Um, uh, Cyril, do you want to have a go at that? Definitely. Um I think it does uh, to a certain extent. I don't want to preempt uh, the, the the actual CFOs answering for 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 them. But my understanding, of speaking with uh, with CFOs, is that um, the exactness of uh, the data that they send out is is very very important, especially in the quarterly and the annual reports. Uh, the pressure is increasing a lot because now, especially in Europe, you have the Alternative Investment Fund Manager Directive, which uh, somehow involved third parties. Uh, in in the way that um, they are supposed to give a kind of um, educated opinion on the valuation process that you have set up and check, of course, that it's applied consistently. But at the same time, they don't have the intimate knowledge that uh, your team might have of the underlying assets. And so 
uh, I, I think that the, the, the pressure is definitely increasing. And, and, and also because on the other side, the, the, the readers of this information, so the fund investors are uh, themselves under pressure, increasing pressure in, in reporting internally, but also showing that they pay attention and, uh, and that the compliance function can, can be addressed on, on this uh, specific matter. And um, I, I would add that uh, the fact that we had some major events recently, especially, for example, in the Middle East with, with a fund manager basically uh, getting in trouble and disappearing in the course of the, the six to nine months following the discovery is increasing even the, the scrutiny and, and, and the pressure on, on both sides of the, the table. Uh, Makbul, does it depend on the type of private capital fund? For example, I would imagine that real estate would have less frequent data demands. Would that be an incorrect assumption? Uh, that is correct. And look, uh, again, coming back to my earlier point, it depends on the size you're at. If you're with a large corporate investment manager, um, I think reporting plays a big part in the CFO function. Of course, any data is important for yourself, let alone investors. You need to understand the data and make sure it's accurate so you can make the right decisions. In my current role in a sort of a, a slightly smaller fund manager, it's a top five concern. I, I'm an insomniac anyway, so that's not the only thing that keeps me awake. But I, I would say it's probably number four or five. I mean, I think ultimately uh, the modern CFO, I mean, if you can say that, um, is focused on ensuring that you know his uh, sort of object, his or her objectives are aligned with the business and with the investors, and that's performance. Uh, you know, obviously we're not investing, but we're helping to make sure that deals are structured accurately, that debt financing is in place. So it's performance, I would say, in the first instance, making sure that um, the business is running right, fees are being collected, you, you're hiring the right people, etc. Uh, but of course, data is in there, but I wouldn't say it's it's top of the list, but with all the increased demands, it's it's certainly uh, volume wise and, and uh, frequency wise. And also people want the information much quicker. It's definitely something that has uh, moved up a lot in the last 10 years. But for me, it's not the number one priority, but it's definitely you, know, you want to make sure you're not reporting information and then having to correct it later. You want the right information for yourself anyway. Right. So. Uh, it, it's definitely important. Um, um, so yeah, uh, uh, important, but dependent on the on the sector you're in. To your point, Richard, um, and I, maybe we can touch upon this later. S sometimes, if you're working for a multi-strategy investment manager, which I've done, there is this sort of confusion treating real estate and private equity the same as a sort of liquid investments, where people have certain systems or whatever in place. And they want to mirror that across the board and it doesn't work like that right a value of a real estate asset doesn't change every day right so. right um Chitra, you were nodding uh quite no, vigorously all all, all, yeah. all points well made by mcpool and cyril right so yeah the returns are obviously the primary concern of any fund and its cfo because that's really what uh, uh, makes investors happy uh but but just taking a view as a service provider a degree remote right so uh, it's putting that correct data into the hands of the cfo too uh, which is important i values don't change in a private capital world but the complexities and the way we structure deals have changed tremendously the reach across the globe has is is completely different in over the last 20 years right so people create vehicles and SPVs and, and, and hold assets in multiple countries, which is so far removed from where the CFO's office is. That is the demand of information that they need to consolidate in order to be able to give valid inputs and reliable inputs to their investors. So it is about you know uh, getting timely and accurate information that helps them to handle their investors. And that the, the, the landscape is has changed significantly, and that's really what brings the complexity. Uh, as much no. as it will be the the, the results and the returns, uh, these are going to keep changing and, and adding to the challenge, if I may say that. So beyond the, the issue of returns, um, which clearly comes up very high in our surveys too, um, Patrick, apart from data on performance what 
what data are nice to have and what data are uh, essential to have? I mean, to, to, has this, for example, I come from the the custody world, and I know that particularly when due diligence uh, happens or when you're looking to point to enter a new relationship, there are things you ask for because a consultant has said it's a good idea to ask for it, mm. not that mm. you necessarily need it. Mm. If uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll answer in a second, but maybe we can take a step back to your previous question because I think I think what what I would like to add is the fact that uh, there's probably nothing that that sort of keep us sleepless at, at night at uh, at this point in time when it comes to reporting, but but what what we should be thinking about is really to have a well quality a robust data management strategy because eventually you will have the requirements out there from the regulators or from the LPs. So now is really the time to get the proper data management strategy in place. Uh, with, with this said and, and answering your question, I think I think uh, must must have um, a little bit the same thing. Take a, take a step back and look at, at, uh, at some of the mega trends and, and the big picture. And of course, if you if you look at ESG and, and diversity and inclusion, that's that's uh, what I would call a, a, a mega trend, a global mega trend, rather than something that will you know go away in a, in a short while. So so I think even though it's not a must today, it will be over time, and, and we can definitely see that on the regulatory side of things as well. So I, I think I think that's that's what probably what I would add to the discussion at, at this point. I mean, Macbul already pointed out a few important things on 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 the more uh, profitability side uh, the profitability side of things um and Cyril, on on the breadth of data that that uh, people require is the desire for more data a result of market need or a result of a perceived ability of technology to provide it and perhaps i'll come to chitra on the same question yeah, it's it's actually a, a very challenging one because um, there is a bit of chicken and egg here. Uh, when I started uh, uh, to, to work in Phonophones, it was back in 2005, one of the biggest concerns we had was to be able to report non-performance data also to our investors. So just knowing what were the net new jobs that were created uh, uh, by the underlying businesses. And it was very difficult to, to collect this kind of information, for example. And, and then as time went by, we started to get more and more. And then there is a question at a certain stage, which is what is relevant and what is too much or information overflow. And, and some of the, the fund investors might argue that actually today they're literally under a, a, a wave of, of, of reports and they have a little bit of trouble to, to, to process it. So I think the, the next stage would be to uh, for them to be able to plug somehow their, their systems uh, and, and that there is interoperability because some of the data can easily flow from uh, the funds to the fund investors and the rest needs still some sort of analysis and, and understanding. And this is the part where uh, maybe the fund investors should focus their attention to extract the relevant information for them. But this is not so straightforward because there is no template, and, and I assume that the reason why there is no template, or if the template which exists is, is, is insufficient, because the the uh, fund investors themselves are very heterogeneous, and what they pay attention to depends on their geographical region, but also the nature of their liabilities, and, and also the time constraint. If you're an insurance group, you need to deliver your own report fairly fast after the year, year end. And if you're a family office, your driver wait maybe a little bit more, but process the information only once, for example. So that creates a lot of tension on uh, the fund managers to provide uh, information, which is at the same time uh, fitting this insurance group and that family office without duplicating the work and being overwhelmed. The, the last thing I wanted to add is, and I go along with what Chitra said earlier, which I agree with uh, fully, is that the fund managers themselves are able to produce more information because, for example, if you look at what's happening at the larger end of the market in large and mega buyout, for example, they often have a fourth 
uh, division next to the front, middle, and back office, which is the post investment advisory. And this probably produces a lot of data. So you have this, this gold mine basically of raw data, which is waiting to, to be exploited. But then the question is, what do you do with it? How much can you disclose? What is confidential? What is disclosable? And what would LPs do with it also? Um, Chitra, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, and, and I, I like the analogy to chicken and egg that Cyril did made. So it, it, it is very debatable. Was it the technology that drove the need for data? I wish it was. Then so many of us wouldn't have the challenge that we have to produce that kind of data. I think it's uh, regulatory needs. I think it is the needs like ESG. Uh, the changing social consciousness of the people which is driving many of these things, ESG and D&I, regulatory needs which drive Form PF and AFM, all these have enhanced the need for how you organize and arrange your data and file into regulators. And that's pushed. Uh, always, most often, technology has, cha has been on the tail of these needs and, and, and is chasing, more so in the private capital world. Now, needless to say, you hear fancy things on black blockchain and machine learning and artificial intelligence and prediction and data analytics. It has its influence. We are living under the shadow of that in the world today. So you would have that influence on, on data needs and data analytics, but I would still feel we are more at the earlier stage in the primitive stage of our evolution from that perspective when it comes to private capital. Um, I should actually have thrown in one other possible factor and that is regulation. Um, Nagpul, is regulation a driver of, of uh, demands for data in your experience? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that's a good point, and I'll come to it in a minute. But just to come back to the earlier point um, um, on what is driving the, the information, is it the technology or is the markets? I think it's definitely the markets or the wider society, right? ESG is an example. And um, in our space in real estate, you know, can I say we're lucky or not? We, we just basically report on energy efficiency. We don't have companies with people. I think those ESG reporting requirements for corporate private equity are much more elaborate. Um, the other thing that I've seen in real estate or in just in private equity, I would say that has also increased in the last 10 years is debt reporting, right? Just because investors want to avoid what happened in the in the credit crunch. They want more detail on your, on your debt uh, to make sure that the levels are acceptable, but also that you're not artificially driving up um, returns. Then there's also organizations like in, in our space, in real estate, like NREF, which is a group that represents uh, LPs that are invested in non-listed real estate uh, that have come up with sort of more standardized reporting, which is good as long as everyone starts asking the same reporting and people are not uh, going outside of NREF reporting. Um, but your point, Richard, on compliance is an important one. ESG, debt reporting, that stuff, all my colleagues also understand because investors are asking them as well. Compliance, regulatory, they don't see any of that, right? And it's my experience in the last 20 years, it's become a, a really big, big burden. Uh, and I don't mean that negatively, negatively, but it's it's just so much more difficult to open up bank accounts to get stuff done. And it takes up so much time um, uh, for CFOs, I'm not necessarily talking about reporting, but just the the, the 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 workload of a CFO has increased so much, and people just don't see it, right? Um, and um, I, I think that's where people like Intertrust, Citco, TMF, etc. Can you know, we rely on them to help us out with this because the information requests are just uh, enormous. And um, as a CFO, you want to be closing a deal. You don't want your CEO telling you, why can't we close this deal? Because we haven't opened up a bank account. Now, 10 years ago, five years ago, it was easy to open up a bank account. Now it's become extremely difficult, right? With all the reporting, et cetera. Now that's not sort of investor reporting, but it's still having data around you. So you can quickly put that information together. I was in a firm previously where we looked at automating all of that, you know, and they, they had some consulting firm telling them, that a robot could do that, and it wasn't, you know, it didn't work, right? So, my personal view is, is it's still a lot of manual work, and the only other option, uh, if automation doesn't work, is outsourcing it. Really. So, and uh, that 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 is actually something we'll be coming on to shortly. Sure. Um, but before we close off this section, um, Patrick mentioned megatrends and referred to ESG and 
diversity and inclusion. In the research that we did, which you'll see if you download the paper uh, the hand, under the handout section, demands, looking three years out, demand for increased updates on performance and cybersecurity seem to be the two top areas. Operational SLAs are somewhere in the middle. And ESG and diversity inclusion were uh, at the other end of the spectrum, meaning that updates didn't have, you know, it could be quarterly, it could be monthly, but presumably as these mega trends develop, those priorities are going to shift. Is there anything else you see coming on stream as a demand uh, that, that, that will kind of move to the top of that list or towards the top of that list? Um, Cyril, do you see anything? Definitely, uh, there is uh, this uh, ESG megatrend. That's uh, that's something we observe. It's a it's a very tricky one. Um, there are some geographical discrepancies again. Um, I think the concept might not be interpreted the same way, for example, in Europe and in the US. So it it creates some sort of divergence. Uh, and, and and there are some things, for example, that an American LP might require, which is not actually legal to, to ask in, in con on continental Europe. So uh, that's something. But um, the, the other mega trends, if I, if I would formulate it like in, in, in an Olympic way, uh, that would be always uh, more objective information, always uh, a faster transmission, and always more comprehensive. And these three targets are conflicting basically so you you can give away on one end but then you have to make some sacrifices on the other and and these three are really at the core of the engine if i can say so uh, and i've been observing that again and again and again me as a, as someone who has to report even though very modestly with a venture fund but also uh, with clients who, who just tell me that they're uh, always chasing this elusive uh, three targets and and that they have to somehow make compromises. So to answer your, your question, Richard, that would be these three targets, which are a kind of mega trend behind the, the ones that, uh, that were referred to earlier. Right. So now, assuming or recognizing that there is a broad need for CFOs to deliver more data of different forms, some with more urgency, some with less, uh, and that this demand is only going to increase, we're now going to look ahead at what the options are for CFOs to prepare themselves to meet these demands. Um, and I guess a good starting point would be how lean are CFO operations in a private capital fund? So is there spare capacity lying around? What? How, how are they normally structured? I don't know who would like to take that. Perhaps Patrick. <laughs> yeah, I can I can start. Uh, that's an interesting one. I, well, my experience is that it's very lean. Um, at the same time, is it is it efficient and 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 sort of scaling? Uh, no, not to the extent that uh, that it should. And and if if you look at other parts of the of the financial industry. Regardless, if 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 those parts have uh, sort of uh, a lot of legacy from a system perspective or not, uh, clearly there is much more to be done in in private equity. But 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 it is it, it is lean for sure, uh, and that's the way we operate. Is that the common experience? Would you say? Well, uh, I, I think I, I think. Um, if well, let me. Uh, uh, I, I I don't know where to start, but but uh, I can take an example. When I when I joined uh, this industry ten years ago, uh, it felt like going from from a technology perspective. It felt like going back to the nineties, coming from the banking industry. Uh, uh, a lot of Excel, uh, a lot of manual work. Uh, uh, you know, uh, not one single source of truth, etc. And all these things have impact on 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 reporting, on outsourcing strategies, what have you. So, uh, but but clearly, the the technology available today 
helps us to 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 catch up uh but we are not there yet and so, we like to uh, run things lean yeah so in that respect um if and obviously it will depend on on each firm but you're suggesting that the technology in a, a lot of firms is perhaps not at the cutting edge um so if you're in a a private fund that's in that position you've got effectively three options um to put it crudely you can hire more staff to do more stuff you can expand your technology framework and invest in the technology or you can outsource um are those actually alternatives or is do you have to advance on all fronts um Cyril, would you like to have a go at that? Um, it, it's a it's a challenging question. If you don't mind, I will pass because I was answering someone on the chat and, and look uh, back to you. Uh, okay. To okay. Uh, I, I do, there is a question actually for you that uh, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm to happy to I'm okay. happy to to kick it off. Uh, oh. Okay. I, I I think I think first of all you can't outsource a problem. Uh, no. That's my view on it. So so you you need to have the house in order. And and I actually think de depending on size then. But if I look at my own uh, company, my own uh, our business, it has to be a combination. Uh, it has to be a combination of of developing on the technology side, but equally increase the cap uh, capabilities and the capacity in house. But equally work with partners, uh, third party party partners. Um, I, I think again, uh, regardless of how much you do of each, you need to have the house in order because otherwise it will never fly. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think Richard. Um, first of all, it depends on the firm, right? I mean, I've worked for in the past, like over fifteen years ago, for Citigroup property investors. If you're part of a larger financial institution. They have a lot of reporting requirements. They will give you the resources because they have all these internal requirements that they want you to to uh, to meet, right? So it depends on the type of firm. If you're part of a bigger insurance insurer, etc., the the fee income is there or the infrastructure is there. You can share maybe some resources. So that's one thing. Secondly, what I've seen over the last twenty years and uh, is that it's been in phases, right? Uh, there was a phase where pre-credit crunch outsourcing was accepted. Then sort of after 2009-10, people were told, well, you know, you did bad deals and you need to bring stuff back in-house. So, you know, a lot of stuff went back in-house. Now it's outsourced again. So I think there's phases and, and, and that's linked with compliance as well and regulatory uh, requirements. I, I've seen over the last 20 years, it's been a bit like this, right? Um, up and down. Uh, I think... And then there's also geographic. If you're part of a, a US group, sometimes we have to explain that uh, in Europe, you have to outsource in some places, unless you're gonna open up offices in all these countries, uh, you're gonna have to outsource local uh, compliance, financials, et cetera, in Holland and Germany, et cetera. Uh, there's still a discussion whether you then uh, insource or outsource other central functions, but certain country specific uh, functions specifically for real estate, it's different for corporate private equity, you're going to have to find a solution. Someone has to do all that stuff. And unless you open up an office there or you think that you can do it centrally out of London, uh, you'll have to outsource it. So I think um, it's not an easy answer. Um, you know, I, I agree with Cyril. I think what we do is sort of we, we look at, you know, where do we want to add value, right? We don't want to be doing reconciliations, but we want to review them. We don't want to be preparing accounts, but we want to review them. We might not even want to be preparing bank transfers, but we want to release them. So it's sort of figuring out based on your organization, where can you add value? And how do you get investors and everyone else comfortable that that's the right model, right? So uh, because there are a lot of demands and, you know, you can only hire so many people. And especially now with uh, COVID, I mean, we were lucky because our industry was still booming in, in COVID because it was logistics. But, you know, if we had hired too much, we would have to lay people off, right? So uh, it gives you flexibility, you know, not just in COVID, but in any sort of market situation, right? You you can always scale up and scale down uh, with outsourcing and, and tap into the best IT systems, et cetera, for that particular asset class or reporting requirement or whatever. 
Chitra, in your experience, do firms change their mind about this sort of thing? Do they start out, you know, do you find firms saying, we're going to invest in our own technology and then they change their mind because it becomes too expensive or is this, yeah. is this path you need to decide on from the get-go? Absolutely, yes. I have seen and these are typically with much larger organizations and it varies, right? So there are larger funds which set up a lot of things and, and begin investing and in, begin with investing in their own back offices, accounting and, and technology. Uh, most often they do it because private capital, let us acknowledge, is is a complex asset class. It isn't. It ain't the easiest one, and it's not a listed product that, for some reason, structures are different. So they believe that they will get the best in class in terms of expertise to start doing this. And at some stage, at times, this does become way too un unwieldy. Um, costs blow up. You've grown huge teams, and you can't keep pace with technology changes. And we are constantly underserved when it comes to comprehensive technology, which is market products out there. So both of this then make them start looking at, is there an institutional service provider who is investing in all of that and trying to be best in class, who's trying to stay abreast, if not ahead of the marketplace, and it is the right shift. So the sizes do vary. There are people who could just off, uh, outsource. Makbul did refer, refer to how it makes sense to do that. You can't be everywhere. Today, investment is happening around the world. So it, it's a hybrid mix. But I think, yes, it is about keeping the core, keeping your house in order. Uh, Patrick alluded to most CFOs and COOs are focused on that. How do I keep the core and the control? And what can I leverage with a best-in-class institution? And you see transformations happening in some of them who set this up internally. You see all these buyouts, these spin-offs. And, and takeouts, call it whatever. And that's that's a continuing thing that you would see because it is, it's lesser headache to have rely on somebody else's institutional and get everything in under one roof or a couple of vendors than to build it all yourself. You know, it does make leave you becoming a jack of all odds, but. Um, is, is the challenge different? This goes back to something that Makbul said near the beginning. Does the is the challenge different depending on what kind of fund you are? So are there certain options for a real estate fund that wouldn't be feasible for a private equity fund? The more complex the fund, the more distributed the fund is, the more difficult it does become. And more, more, it's, it's better to go with an institutional service provider. That would be the right leaning, a private credit, a real estate, a multi-jurisdictional uh, asset holding, all this will go. A small private equity is not any less complex. There are a lot of deal variations there, but it's probably relatively simpler to keep it in-house. If you have a e-front license and do some things yourself, there are many, many funds who do do that. So there is a variation because the back office spend and the tech spend is significantly higher as the asset class becomes different. Uh, the underlying technologies have to be very different for each one of these asset classes. So that, again, uh, makes you think, should I own it or should I work with somebody else? So these are the drivers, I would believe. Uh, okay. So moving on to um, the final section before we open up for questions, on specifically on the issue of outsourcing or in-house expansion. Um, Makbul, if you were to try and frame the types of issues that might sway a CFO in one direction or another, without necessarily coming down on one side or the other. What are the kinds of things that they need to be they need to take into consideration? Yeah, I mean, just just coming back to the previous point, I've been fortunate enough to work in sort of multi-strategy funds where uh, you know I had to take care of some corporate private equity deals. The biggest difference between a corporate private equity deal is that you don't have to care about the underlying entity. There's a group of people there it's a portfolio company, right? So they will file their accounts. They have lots of people in there, et cetera. With real estate or other sort of asset-only uh, investment strategies, someone still has to file accounts. Someone has to operate bank accounts. Are you comfortable giving all of that to a third-party provider? So, so the, the asset class does make a big difference in terms of, uh, you know, do you outsource or not? Because in private equity, you will have people on the ground because you own a company, right? So I, I think that's a big differential. Look, I think it comes back to, um, you know, what is the size of your firm? As I mentioned, if you're a, 
a part of a financial institution, the chances are you have a bank. You know, when I was at Citigroup, we had an office in Frankfurt. We had an office in Paris. So um, I think it depends on size and it depends on what, what do you want to sort of differentiate yourself on, right? Do you want to be um, vertically integrated or you want to be a, fa a fund manager allocating capital? And, um, and also, wh where's your expertise, right? Are you going to find the right people in London or, you know, you might have an office in Frankfurt or in Paris, but you're not going to have offices in 10 European countries. Do you have the right expertise to file VAT returns, tax returns, etc.? So it's expertise, it's size, it's fee income, right? Uh, you know, do you want to um, do you want to hire people or, you know, everywhere? And ultimately, that's not beneficial to your investors either. Um, or do you want to focus on value add where you can really uh, do all the middle office work, I would say, structuring deals and things like that. That's where you don't typically outsource. Uh, but compliance, you outsource. Uh, bookkeeping, you outsource. Uh, tax compliance, you outsource, really. Um, or, you know, I, ideally you outsource, right? Um, uh, so I, I think it depends on that, right? Where, where do you want to focus on? Because there's so many demands on fund managers now. You want to make sure that your team is focused on the right things and lets experts focus on uh, country-specific stuff. Patrick, do you draw the same lines as far as yeah. value add? And, yeah, yeah I, I fully agree with Makbul. Uh, I think the only thing I would add to the mix uh, is probably is probably sort of, um, well, Makbul touched upon it as well. Do you have a vertically integrated model or not? So looking at uh, at the operating model is, is of course, crucial. Uh, but but it's probably the more soft values, the, the culture aspects and, and, and these kind of things that, that could have an impact. And, and, and also partly the overall strategy for, for the firm. But, but, but clearly size, uh, geographical presence, uh, et cetera, all of those are super important. So what is that Richard, uh, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to to uh, to to to, uh, to add something, uh, and to in line with what Chitra and Magmul and Patrick said, I think what we have to remember is that there used to be a time where um, reporting and, and data production was just to communicate, but now since we have a permanent fundraising process in some institutions, it became an argument actually to. Uh, leverage uh, the capacity of the institution to showcase its expertise. And I think that that's introducing a new dynamic. What used to be perceived as a cost and somehow a burden now becomes a, a commercial argument and a way to actually differentiate yourself versus the competition. And I think as much as we're going to move in that direction, there will be more investment, more uh, will uh, maybe also to to deliver uh, higher quality information. And that's where probably the intervention of, uh, uh, let's say, specialized institution will be even more relevant. Uh, you're going to recruit this expert to uh, achieve this. Maybe earlier Chitra referred to artificial intelligence under the form of deep learning or, or big data. That might come handy to have an expert helping you with this and still continuing to be the backbone and, and uh, let's say, the, the key reference in, in the, inside the structure to deliver this output to uh, prospective and actual uh, investors. Does that mean that CFOs have to become, or CFO divisions have to become more tech savvy, even if they're not actually um, producing the output, even if they outsource certain functions? Is, is the nature of the of what they have to produce, something that would come naturally to a, a traditional CFO. If I, if I remembered, 20 years ago, we invested in one of the very first uh, uh, software providers in the industry. And, um, and, and the field test literally was our, our CFO function. And so I, I would say that they, they were in any way in the front line in that respect. And, and they're still today, uh, they're the ones who need to, for example, look into uh, virtual data rooms. They are the ones who need to automate certain parts of their communication to feed a specific uh, uh, a thread for a specific type of LP. So I'm not sure that they need to be fluent in, in, uh, in uh, high-tech languages in that sense, but they need to have this kind of 
um, supervisory role uh, that actually Matt Gould and Patrick somehow referred to earlier as well as Chitra. They need to understand what's the expected output and then formulate the requirement to the experts who will then deliver the, the, the tools that they, they, they need. Okay, and um, there's a question that actually was addressed to you, Cyril, but um, it would be interesting to get uh, everyone's perspective on this. Um, I'll read it out. From your standpoint and experience, for the next period, could you share the view for less liquid assets and their reporting data toward more liquid assets and their reporting data? Are the potential outcomes given by the current data a double-edged sword when meeting demanding timelines of executed investments and exits? Also, and then there's a tacked on, it's really a second question. Also in the future, how do you see the role of mega funds? But let's start with that distinction between liquid and illiquid assets, because we have touched on it to a degree, but I want to a degree, but I wonder if anyone wants to add something to that. Um, perhaps Cyril, we could, we could, since the question was originally addressed to you, we could start with you. Yes, uh, that's why I was uh, caught off, off, off guard by your, your question <laughs> earlier. And my answer in, in substance is that uh, there is a bit of limitation. Um, and the, the limitation is related to the fact that private businesses produce naturally less information. Information of high quality is very expensive to produce. So when you're listed, uh, you produce it because the regulators tell you to do so, but because you're formatted to do that and you have an expensive function, there was a uh, a big four uh, some time ago quantified the cost of producing such information when you're listed and it was a staggering four million per year. I'm just quoting out of my mind and it's an average obviously, but uh, when you're investing in, in venture uh, capital and, and in startups, uh, this kind of budget is, is simply out of reach. So there, there is a trade-off here and, and I'm not sure we will ever reach the point where we can be as efficient as uh, hedge fund manager and producing information, you know, top notch, uh, end of the month, maybe next day or something. I'm not sure we will ever reach that. But but we can try to somehow get closer to that and understand what's nice to have and what a must have. And 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 in that respect, yes, there, there should be some sort of confluence uh, of 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 uh, of the way of thinking because, as Chitra mentioned earlier, these are obviously the same people reading the reportings. Uh, from the listed investments and the private one. Now, uh, for, for the second part of the question, um, what I tried to convey earlier is that there is an arbitrage to do between the quickness, the granularity, and the precision. It, in an ideal world, we would do that, and, and that's where the experts would help us to, to achieve that. But um, it's very difficult to reconcile these three on a permanent basis. So last year, the COVID was a, a real-time test. Uh, the fund manager scrambled. They tried to provide some information, but it was not particularly granular because simply we didn't know. So we, we gathered some uh, empirical evidence. We built an image and we were quick to react to, to communicate to the LPs. But it, it wasn't very granular and it wasn't particularly precise, but it was fitting the need at that time. And, and I think that's a very good example, for example. Um, does anyone else want to come in on that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, again, I, I've, I think certainly in the illiquid private capital space, we can um, learn from what's in the liquid space, but also conversely, I mean, I've worked for uh, liquid fund managers that have gone into a liquid and, and, you know, you see it regularly, big institutions out of the US wanting to get into alternatives. I think at the same time, those institutions have to understand that illiquid investments are, are quite different in terms of valuations, which is quite important, expertise, technology, etc. right? Uh, I think whenever you see sort of a big North American uh, liquid investment manager getting into illiquid investments, it, it takes a while to explain to them, you know, this is real estate or private equity. You know, you don't have, you can't use the system. It's really more based on, on people and, and, and expertise. Then obviously you have the added sort of complexity of explaining to people from North America that you have different gaps and all of that, right? Taxes and all that, because they're used to sort of dealing in one sort of big market where everything is done according to the same gap. So I, I think both sides sort of can learn something from from uh, from one another. But my experience has mainly been from liquid 
managers getting into a liquid space and, and really having unrealistic expectations on on technology and valuation, really. Um, Chitra, did you want to say something? Uh, I can add, right? So yeah. I, I, I think it is incorrect and impractical to expect the same amount of turnaround and transparency from illiquid and liquid managers. You, you, It's almost impossible to value private assets in overnight and give it by T5, put out all, all valuations. It's, it's uh, at the risk of doing something wrong in the valuation. So it'll never get that close. But investors will ask for underlying investments. How are they performing? How is your rent collect? It's, it's possible. They may not be there, but it's so easy to ask because data is, it's a, that's the nature of data. How are your rent collections going? What's your occupancy rates? These are very easy questions to ask to see how the portfolio is performing. And that's really where data and slicing and dicing becomes a different uh, question it's it's not that so in fact while in the survey we do have answers that they want daily transparency i don't think everything in a private fund calls for daily transparency there isn't much to show every day in terms of pro progress right but uh, do the do the cfos want to know where their cash is when they have 150 plus uh, spvs i think they would be interested in that uh, and that's an important data need. And would the fund uh, for the investors want to know that they are on top of those cash and, and, and they're reconciling in the world where phishing and uh, uh, these kind of frauds are so, so apparent? Yes. So it all depends on certain aspects which need daily control. And uh, many other aspects will be periodic and timely. But the incisive nature of asking for more uh, will be driven by by awareness of technology, the the ability to ask for more, and people will keep pushing and asking. And, and on that score, there's time for perhaps one last question, and it comes from Brian Nordland, and it looks at that same question, but from the other angle. So how large a role does variation in requirements between LPs play in the demands to the CFO back office function? For example, LPs looking for the same type of data, but with a specific requirement to data structure or approach. Is that uh, something that any of you recognize as a... Yeah, I, I mean... Can, I can jump. Ah, okay, let's, let, well, let's Please. start with Patrick, because you're on the far end of my... Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, today that that's a uh, that's challenge, but then I, I, I come back to my point about having a proper data management in place, because if, if, you, if you have that, you can quite easily manage the different, uh, the different situations and the different requests from uh, when it comes to more bespoke uh, reporting. That would be my short answer. Cyril, were you going to say the same thing or...? Uh, I, I almost wanted to concur with Patrick, uh, and and, and um, the clear example is when you answer RFPs. Um, uh, a lot of investors, when they plan to invest, uh, ask you to go through this process, and then you would see that often eighty percent of the data is the same, but it's just presented differently. And and actually, in uh, in an institution I used to to work with, uh, we implemented the software to enter this eighty percent somewhere, then press a button almost and then format it out for this specific LP and then we would focus on the 20% which were LP specific. That was a good way to save a lot of time and resources. So in that sense, uh, I agree with, with Patrick, uh, data management matters a lot. Okay, and at th that time, I think we're pretty much out of time unless anyone would like a final word that they've been dying to say, but I haven't let them say it. Okay, um, it just remains then for me to thank all the panel and don't forget to download the paper that we've been referring to because and I'm sure uh, we'll be very happy to answer any questions that arise out of it. So I hope you enjoyed it and thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks all of you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.